So it is my pleasure, again, to be able to um, start off this morning introducing our um, first plenary speaker. Um, but before I do, I was thinking last night how over the years, um, Echo has been able to see how universities have been able to play a role in the work of international development and specifically international agriculture development. And there's a specific role, I think, for Christian universities in this. And Dr. Price saw that in his own life at Geneva College. And he has also worked with many other professors in these Christian universities. And I know there's many Christian universities um, represented at the conference this year. And it's a, it's a unique, it's this unique niche that these um, universities can fill that some of the bigger, larger land grants aren't able to do to address issues that are so important to small scale farmers that often get overlooked. And I was thinking about that, and I've heard Dr. Price talk about that in the past, and I've seen this work out in so many ways, and we have so many stories we could share about professors from Dort, professors from Calvin, it, the list goes on and on, um, Geneva College and so many other places. But then I thought, you know, today, this morning, we actually have a great example and a, really a shining star in how this has played out. And Dr. Ben Dubé, who is a professor in biology at Eastern University. And he received his PhD um, from the University of Florida. Woo, oh, got some gators? Okay, they're, they're everywhere. Um, that was Bob, wasn't it? <laughs> um, and there he studied in the Department of Entomology and Nematology. He began his scientific career in Zimbabwe, where he worked with the Ministry of Agriculture um, in plant protection. At Eastern, Ben conducts research on agricultural nematode, nematology and teaches courses in ecology, parasitology, and entomology. Man, they gave me a lot of big words this morning. Uh, it's a little early for that. But Ben, Dr. Dubé, I just want to thank you for how you have used your career in researching and teaching the youth about international agriculture and how they can do it in their mission work and their development work. We have received many wonderful candidates that have come through Eastern that you have mentored and taught, and we are very appreciative to that. But what we're more appreciative of is how they're going out on the field and serving small-scale farmers. If you'd please come join me. And we'll welcome Ben Adube. Well, thank you so much. I'm truly grateful for ECHO for giving me this opportunity to, you know, say a few things about the nematodes. Let, let me start by saying probably the one opportunity ECHO has given me is to answer a few questions that I always receive every year. As soon as I come here, the first question is, what are nematodes? <laughs> now, the kind of answers I get in most cases, oh, I know what nematodes are because we use them for fishing. Wow. <laughs> Then, of course, the other question I always uh, I mean, get asked, where are you from? As soon as I open my mouth, it's either nematodes or where are you from? <laughs> well, let me answer those two questions once and for all today. I was born in Zimbabwe, so that answers where are you from? 
It's not that people don't realize or see that I'm from Pennsylvania. I understand that. It's just the way I talk somehow almost begs the question, where are you from? So hopefully I've answered that. The second question about nematodes, well, let's see how we can answer that as well, because it is a long story. Now, the one thing that I cannot do today is give you everything about nematodes. It's practically impossible. I mean, nematodes are such a big group, at least for us. But I know for a lot of people, they're just somewhere in the corner somewhere. But for us, it's a big, big group of pests. Now, one of the things that actually happened when I came to the University of Florida, my professor said, well, you know, you come here, you want to learn agriculture. I said, yes, that's really what I want to do. He said, what area do you want to study? I said, well, anything that will help my people in Zimbabwe. Well, he said, well, what do you really think you can do? In the end, I said, well, anything really. He says, well, I'm going to give you one thing that you'll, I said, okay. He said, you'll be studying nematodes. I said, ah, oh, that's a big insect. <laughs> he said, well, son, that's not really that. It's something else. And that really started me on a journey. Up to now, I think almost every day, other than anything else, I talk about nematodes, nematodes, and nematodes. <laughs> I dream nematodes, <laughs> nematodes, nematodes. OK. Now, one of the things that I want to hopefully just give you an idea is these are parasites. And as parasites, they've really had an impact in agriculture. So let me take you on this journey where I will give you once and for all what nematodes are, what we can do to manage them. So that's precisely what I'm trying to do. Now, the one thing that happens when you talk about nematodes is the economic impact of nematodes. Now, obviously, there are so many things in agriculture that impacts agriculture. But nematodes have really come up to a point where they are almost equated to insects, to fungal pathogens, bacterial pathogens. And for us, it is the big thing. We really think without having to do anything about nematodes, we are going to have a problem in agriculture. So in the US, you probably won't see these kind of figures for any other pest. But it is one of the biggest problems currently in the US, particularly here in the state of Florida. I don't know whether you've ever realized this, but every university thrives to have so many departments. But very few really have departments solely to nematology or any aspect of that. And that's why University of Florida really takes me to a point where I feel it's one of the greatest, not only in the US, but in the world. So in terms of impact, the cost to agriculture has been immense. And for that reason, this is one of the pests that has really caused immense problems, not only for the tropical world, subtropical, temperate. That takes you the whole world, actually, when you look at that. So these are pests that need to be taken seriously. But of course, as it always, we need to learn about these pests first before we can do anything. Now, in talking about nematodes, I'm going to talk mainly about one group of nematodes. These are the root knot nematodes. 
We normally just abbreviate RKN. Now, I really didn't want to talk about the taxonomy and all. I mean, let's leave that. But nematodes belong to one genus, the Meloidogyne species. Now, in that genus Meloidogyne, there are well over 100 species of Meloidogyne. Amongst those 100 species, there are four that really have had an impact on world agriculture. That's Meloidogyne incognita, Meloidogyne javanica, Meloidogyne arenaria, and Meloidogyne hapla. Those four have caused immense problems worldwide. So when I talk about root knot nematodes this morning, chances are I'm referring to any one of those four. Of course, there are also other nematodes like the soybean cyst. This is heterodera glycines, or maybe the potato nematode, the globodera rostochensis. These are also nematodes that are important, but for now, I think root knot nematodes is way up there in terms of importance. So I will be referring to this nematode most of the time. Now, let me see, just test you a little bit. If here is one of the nematodes and there is the other. Now, tell me which is which. Okay, <laughs> I guess some of you know. If you look, this is a plant parasite. This is one of the nematodes that has caused so much damage to the crops. If you look at the facial features of this nematode, it's looking directly at you. <laughs> right now, it's really looking right into your eyes. But of course, what you see there is some structures that look like eyes are not eyes at all. Those are called amphids. Those are receptors, chemoreceptors. Nematodes do not have eyes. So on the other side, you're looking at another nematode. That's an animal parasite. And some of you know that's a hookworm. The genus is Ancylostoma. As you can see, these two nematodes are looking directly at you. But the one thing you see common in both, they don't have eyes. They have teeth, animal parasite, to grab on to the intestine. The plant parasite his structures, the stylet, that's the structure that it uses to draw nutrients from the plants, and that's what causes problems. Now, imagine nematodes are like someone who wants food. Now, the best place to find food is the kitchen. So you will find when I talk about nematodes, I'm really talking about nematodes that have stationed themselves in a kitchen. That's where the food is. But the plant parasite goes further. It not only stays in the kitchen, but it positions itself in the fridge. <laughs> that is where the food is. Who needs eyes when you can just stretch your arms and get all the food you need? That's why they don't have eyes. But they are very destructive indeed. So we'll look at that. What are nematodes? Well, at least I've answered that now. These are microscopic worms, nothing near the kind of worms used for fishing. Those are earthworms, very different in structure, in taxonomy. These are very, very small. Also, 
In most cases, people think, well, these worms are vermiform, cylindrical. The one nematode I'll talk about this morning is actually both. Part of it is cylindrical. The other part is saccate, round, or globus, as we call it. So different shapes you'll find with these nematodes. Now, 25%, as you will see, those are the plant and animal parasites. When you talk about the group of nematodes, they are about 25% of the whole group. Those are the ones that give us the real problems. Now, where do you find nematodes? Everywhere. Everywhere. I would bet if I took a sample of the paper we have this morning, I would find a nematode. Well, probably I'm stretching you too far, but really, Nematodes are found everywhere. In every habitat, you will find a nematode. Actually, there is a joke in nematology by the Germans. Well, I hope there are not Germans in here. <laughs> they always said nematodes are even found in a beer mat. You know, really? So whenever they're having meals, there's a nematode somewhere nearby? Well, I don't know. But certainly, they are found virtually everywhere. They are very dominant in terms of numbers. 80,000 species, only second to one group. In that group are arthropods. <clears throat> now, the insects are the most dominant. Nematodes come second. But in terms of the ability to parasitize, nematodes are no way, even in any way, any other parasite can compare to nematodes. They are the most adapted to parasitism. So that's why they cause these problems. Now, the groups I'm referring to, you'll find one group, 50% are marine. you find these in the oceans. And of course, 10% is the group that gives us the real problem. Those are the plant parasites. Those are the ones that really attack the crops. 15% are the animal parasites. The hookworms, that parasite that causes elephantiasis, you probably know that as well. Those are all within the animal parasites. Then another 25% there are really just free living, good nematodes we need in the rhizosphere. So when I'm talking about the plant parasites, I'm really looking at the 10%, a very small percentage really. But the impact is immense when you consider these parasites. So, body shapes, like I mentioned, the majority, 95%, are vermiform, meaning cylindrical, look like an ordinary worm-like. But don't forget this other small percentage, 5%, as you can see, they don't look like a, a worm at all. Some are lemon-shaped, some are slightly roundish, others we call this saccate. And as you can see, when I refer to nematodes, these are the sort of shapes that I'll be looking at when I look at the root knot nematodes. Now, a typical nematode would look like that. In this case, what you see is a stylet a very important structure for the nematode because this is where it extracts nutrients from the plants. But at the same time, that very same structure can secrete some enzymes from the nematodes to change the environment where they are feeding. So it is really a very interesting type of structure in a nematode. Then in most cases when we identify nematodes, we use the vulva for the female and spicules for the male. That's in taxonomy. But typically, a nematode would look like that. Well, this one does look like it's segmented. Well, again, nematodes try and fool us. They are not segmented at all. There is just one tube straight through we call those superficial segmentations, the annulations. 
They just own the outside. Inside is the straight tube. It's not segmented. So when you look at nematodes, one of the things to really think about when you think about how to manage nematodes is to know the life cycle of the parasite. Many times we jump in, try and manage parasites. If you don't know how they live, how they reproduce, you are shooting a target in the dark. So the one thing we need to know is the life cycle. It's about 30 days complete life cycle. It starts off with an egg and it hatches the first stage juvenile in the egg, and what hatches from the egg is the J2 or the second stage juvenile. So really what you find are four molds in five stages. So the way the nematode change from one stage to the other is by molting. And these are juveniles, implying once that egg hatches, the structure of the nematode is similar in terms of its vermiform right up to the adult stage. But the J2 is the most important stage. That is the infective stage. If you can target whatever management strategy on the J2, that's hitting the bull's eye, as we call it. So that is why we need to know where to find the J2 first. After that, one of the problems with nematodes is high fecundity, the ability to reproduce so many offspring in a short space of time. This is one of the things you find in parasites. Even some animals, those of you probably heard from Tanzania, if you think about the wildebeest, how much the wildebeest just reproduces. The idea is no matter how much the lions take the wildebeest, they keep on adding more and more. And talk about the wildebeest, the young calf of the wildebeest will start walking within hours of birth and run as fast as the wildebeest within hours. There's no time to waste. That is what you call the adaptation to make sure there are so many of these wildebeests to overwhelm lions or the predators. Nematodes just do that very same thing. Now, if you look at the development of the root knot nematode, there is the J2, which is vermiform. Then it grows. Oh, you need to go back. Where's me? All right, there you are. So, there is the J2, the one that's vermiform, and all these other stages you see are stages that do not feed. The J2 is the infective, that's the one that seeks for the host. If you can control that, manage that, all these other stages really are almost useless. But that J2 will grow on to J3, J4, and as you can see, it starts getting bigger and bigger until it reaches the adult stage where the shape now is like that, globus. That is the adult female of a root knot nematode. What you see right behind there is an egg mass. That's where it lays its egg. Thousands. Again, the ability to reproduce at that rate is what makes this parasite very successful. So that's another thing. Then, of course, when you look at these nematodes, where do they live? Well, I alluded to that. They live where the food is. So the ectoparasites, those the ones that feed from outside, Again, think of it as a parasite that lives in the kitchen, but maybe slightly outside the kitchen. Those are the parasites, again, in the soil. They feed outside the roots, ectoparasites. Then the majority 
are the endoparasites. They live right inside the root. Now, the one special thing about root node nematodes, like I mentioned, is not only in the roots, it lives in the part of the root that produces where there is food, the steel. That's the middle portion of the root where you find your xylem, your phloem, that's where the food is flowing. So the nematode positions itself right there so that it doesn't have to do much. Just like stationed in the fridge, you get all the food you need, you don't have to stretch your... So really when you look at this nematode, it's such adapted to be the best in terms of parasitism. Well, let's not forget paras I mean, nematodes can also affect stems, leaves, seeds. So when you look at that, every part of the crop is susceptible to be attacked by nematodes. But the nematodes are cleverer than that. They start off in the soil. Why? We can't see them. What you cannot see is difficult to manage. A whole lot of times when I ask my students the pests, they'll mention insects, they can see them. Fungal pathogens, hopefully they can see them. Bacteria, they can see the effects. Very few will mention nematodes because they cannot be seen, they're right in the soil. But when you consider the damage, it's probably the one pest that should be way up there in terms of importance. So, now we know about this, I'm just going to give you a picture. Here is a nematode feeding on the root from the outside. You can actually see the stylet probing on the plant cell. So here's a nematode feeding on the plant from the outside. Here is the one endoparasite. Those red stains, those are the nematodes. Notice within the root structure, they are not on the periphery, what you might call some of those melancholic slime cells. They are right in the middle of the stem or the root, the steel area where there's a whole lot. It's like the highway for the food. That's where these nematodes are stationed. And those are the endoparasites. So in terms of their position, really, they know where to be. The root knot nematode goes a bit further. It positions itself in the steel, but then what it does, as soon as it starts feeding, it initiates the cells to actually grow bigger. Those cells you see around, as you can see, the, I wish I could point that. Uh, well, all right. There is the nematode, there is the head, and what you see here are the cells. So you see all these are giant cells initiated by the nematode as it starts feeding. The interesting thing is, these cells here do not actually divide, they just grow bigger. That is one adaptation to draw more nutrients to the nematode. And the one other thing you will find with this particular nematode is, as it feeds, it does not normally injure the cells. It takes out a tube from its mouth, the esophageal glands, sends it to the cells and siphons the food. That means it's doing very little in terms of the energy, but it's siphoning all the food. So we normally say this is like a nutrient sink. All the food is being siphoned to the nematode. The nematode doesn't move. It's stationary. And that really is a high adaptation of parasitism. Think of anything may be compared to a tapworm. That's how these root knot nematodes. So whenever you look or you think about root knot nematodes, this feeding 
kind of structure which we call giant cells is one adaptation we don't see in so many other groups, very typical of root knot nematodes. That also is the way they initiate the galling. The idea of root knot is like a root gall. The name comes from the way these nematodes feed. As they feed, they actually produce a swelling on the roots. And that is the galling. I'll show you in a minute what this looks like. So, you look at the same nematode, there is the nematode, there is the head, and that's the still area where the food is. Right out here is the egg mass, producing a lot of eggs, and as you can see, part of the root there is protruding. That is the formation of the gall. So when you talk about root galling, that is how these nematodes eventually initiate this root galling. It is one of the features. Every time, if you think about nematodes, this is the one thing you will see as a symptom of root knot nematode damage. You can never be wrong when you look at these galls. But I just wanted to give you some details on how they are formed. Now, what are the conditions for these nematodes? Well, aerated soils, plenty of oxygen. Temperature, 25 to 30 Celsius. Moisture, field capacity. Soil texture, well, aerated, slightly more sandy soils. When you really think about it, in the rhizosphere, about 12 inches. Those are the optimal conditions for the nematode. But surely those are also the optimal conditions for what? For the crop. If you look at all that, any agronomist would want to provide those kind of conditions. So whatever you do for the crop, you are doing the very best thing for the nematode. That is the problem. How then do you make nematodes uncomfortable? Because whatever you do, you are actually making your crops uncomfortable as well. That is where the problem comes. So I thought I'd give you that. Now, what are the crops affected by nematodes? If I started listing the crops, the list would go on and on and on. All tropical, almost all. Almost all subtropical almost all temperate crops are affected by nematodes. Now, think about it. It means right from Florida, you can go as far north as North Canada. You will talk about nematodes. That is a big, wide spectrum of the host. And that's why we really think this is a major pest. Cereals, grains, fruits, vegetables, some ornamentals. Well, for Florida, even the turf grass is affected by nematodes. And believe you me, in Florida is a big business. All the golf courses in Florida are employing nematologists, not for anything, to control nematodes on turf grass. Now, that's a big business. But for us, maybe that's not really important. We are looking at the crops. But I just want to show you how important nematodes are, not only for crops, but even for grasses as well. How do they damage? Well, the main target, like I mentioned, the direct feed. These are the ectoendo. They predispose the nematodes to secondary infections. This is one other thing. When the nematode punctures a hole in the root and penetrates, all other pathogens follow, the fungi, the bacteria. So whenever you have a problem on fungal pathogens, it might have been led into the root by the nematode. So you are looking at a nematode really exposing the root to so many other pathogens. And not only that, 
they can also transmit viruses. So when you look at plants that are affected by viruses, chances are you think about so many other carriers or vectors and never imagine nematodes transmitting viruses. They actually do. The yellow ring spot virus is mainly transmitted by nematodes. So really, the nematode disease interaction is probably the worst thing about nematodes. Nematodes can interact, can cooperate with other pathogens to make sure they infect or inflict the worst damage on any crop. Think of the nematode phytophthora interaction on tomatoes. It's one of the biggest problems. You think you are controlling phytophthora? If you forget the nematodes, it's just wasted effort. If you control the nematode and forget the phytophthora, it's a wasted effort. That's what makes nematodes such a special in terms of these interactions. So, because of these interactions, the effect obviously is it reduces the water flow to the plant, the nutrients. It weakens the plant. As you can see, the roots are the main targets. Once the animal has been, the plant has been weakened, now you can talk about all the nutritional deficiencies. All other things can attack the crop because it is now weak. It's like the human body. Many times we worry about so many diseases. If you keep your body healthy, it's the one step to really make sure you shield against so many of these pathogens. Same applies to plants. So that is a major factor as well. In the end, for the farmer, he is worried about the yield. So you can imagine, all that is what eventually leads to a reduction of yield. Very important for the farmer. Severity of crop damage, what determines? Again, so many things. It depends with the type of nematode. Is it endoparasite, ectoparasite? Is it a particular nematode? There are so many. So the nematode comes in. Also, infestation levels, meaning the numbers, how many nematodes are in the soil. Is it one nematode? Two thousands. That is, again, a factor in the severity. The crops, what crop are you talking about? High value, low value? Tomatoes are really a high value crop. They are the worst in terms of nematodes. If I wanted to culture nematodes, believe me, we do that. I culture nematodes, obviously, for study. I use nemat I mean, tomatoes as the host. That is the most susceptible host we can find. Environmental conditions are also very important. And in this case, soil type, rainfall patterns, the temperature. This is what makes Florida the heaven for nematodes. The soils are what nematodes need. The weather is precisely what nematodes love. So when you really look at studying nematology, don't go any further. Well, you need to go to Gainesville, not Miami of F. Florida State. You know. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Anyone who knows about this will know what I'm talking about. So don't go south. Don't go way north. Somewhere in between in Gainesville, that's where you'll find the best place for nematodes. OK. Right. What are the field crop damage symptoms? This is what really sometimes the farmers worry about. Well, you can look at the above ground, the kind of symptoms you find. Reduced patchy growth, stunted growth, premature crop wilting, and even chlorosis. That means the yellowing of leaves, stems, and everything. That is what you see above ground. But remember, the pest is below ground. So at some point, it's going to do a lot of damage below ground as well. Reduced vigor. 
for your plant. Below ground, surely root galling is the main thing you see as a symptom. But that's not all. Excessive root branching, also necrotic roots, malformed, distorted roots, all that gives you the way nematodes attack the crop. What you see above, there is so much below. As you can see, the nematodes will show you these symptoms in the field. Just to give you again, this is an aerial view of the soybean cyst nematode damage. Soybean cyst is the heterodera glycines. It's the one pest any soybean farmer is afraid of. What you see there is a patchy kind of distribution of nematodes. That is typical. Nematodes are not normally distributed. They are patchy. So that would be what you see from above. Well, if you now go slightly nearer, that's again a patchy nematode damage symptom that you see. As you can see, areas as if someone went in, doused some area with some kind of pesticide that bent the crop. That is typical nematode damage kind of symptoms. Also, of course, like I mentioned, the gold roots. This is, if you were to really bet yourself right now, if you go to your home, pull out the tomato plant and look at the roots, I bet you will see this kind of galling that you see here. That's a tomato root. And for the soybean cyst, that's something strange we've seen re recently. We thought the soybean cyst would only be the soybean cyst nematode. But the root knot nematode now is affecting soybean just. This is from Arkansas. So even the farmers in Arkansas are really crying right there because of the root knot nematode. So this is a serious pest, not only in the US, but worldwide. And those are the sort of conditions you find. Another situation you find in the field, you see a situation like that, a patchy area. Everything else looks OK until you see a patchy area. Then you know something is definitely wrong. Here is another case. This is in Texas on cotton. The reniform nematode is a particular nematode that attacks cotton. You can see the patchiness right there as well. Then, of course, this is in Louisiana. Again, nematode damage, patchiness. This is, again, on cotton. You can see that is what we normally see above ground. Well, come back to Florida. This is the live oak area north of Gainesville. You can see here is one of my professors, Jimmy Rich, looking at the field they attacked on peanuts. That's root knot nematodes. And if you pull out those peanuts, you can actually see the difference with what is infected and what is not. So much difference in terms of what you can do. Then, of course, once you have the pods, these are the kind of things you see as you pull up the pods. You think it's a fungal pathogen, and yet, really, these are nematodes. Now, of course, that's, again, cotton, root knot on cotton. And not only that, this is what sweet potatoes could look like infected with nematodes. You go into a grocery, you will never want to buy that. Then, of course, wheat is another infected host. And not only that, apples infected with nematodes. And not only that, tobacco in North Carolina, they depend on that big, big problem. The number one problem for tobacco farmers is not anything else. It's nematodes, as you can see right there in North Carolina. Then, of course, this is what they will cause the root necrosis of the root on citrus. And this is on Irish potatoes. Of course, nothing Irish about potatoes. But there you are. You can actually see the root root nematode almost showing fungal pathogen-like damage. And this is what can happen to carrots infected with nematodes, deformed, distorted. And that's what you can see below ground. 
vegetables, this is what happens not very far from here, Sanford, sandy soils, that's what they really worry about here in Florida. And of course, coconut palm, they don't spare that as well. That ring you see around here, oh, this ring you see right here, that is a sure sign these are nematodes attacking the area where there's translocation of food, even in the coconut palm. This is a very special nematode that attacks. It's not really the root knot. It's Ragnophilenchus cocophilus. So you are looking now at corn, typical damage, patchy, and of course, citrus. We took this picture right when citrus was such a big thing in the Orlando area. Now I understand citrus is moving down south because of the frost. Bananas, there is a particular nematode that only attacks bananas. So you are looking at a wide array of nematodes. Well, tough grass, like I mentioned, big thing in Florida here. So with that, how do we manage these nematodes? Well, the one thing you cannot even think about, there is no strategy that will attack and destroy all phytonematodes. That's a pipe dream. It will never happen. All you can do really is to look at things like the main objective here is try and reduce the population densities to below types when they can cause damage. So you are only lowering the populations. You are not eliminating anything. It is impossible. So what we do is we try and have prevention is one, avoidance is another, and then lastly, suppression. So in managing nematodes on a low cost, notice I'm not going to talk more about the pesticides, the one thing you really want with nematodes is prevention. Here is the thing. Once a crop has been infected with nematodes, once the J2 have penetrated the root, it's affected completely. Nothing you can do will stop that. So what you need to do is prevent the infection first. And that's what leads us to the most important stage in nematode management, sound agronomic and crop husbandry. It's the one thing people ignore, yet it is the most important. Preventive is better than anything else. Anything else you do to the crop, if you don't prevent it, that's almost a wasted effort. You could cite, I mean, sample the site. Sometimes it's not only feasible. Planting has to be planned. Effective weed control is important. Good soil management, critical. Sanitation, I can never emphasize. That is what prevents spread of nematodes, sanitation. So to me, this is the most important thing you have to do with the nematodes. All these are the things that come later. Really, yes, they can help, but pre-planting strategies are key before the nematodes attack. So what I've done, all these PowerPoints will be available. If you look at the crop resistance, is the other thing. I've listed all the crops that are resistant to nematode damage. So you will have this list here is another list again. So you'll find all the crops that are resistant and the varieties. So if I try and go back probably here, you'll see there is the crop and the variety. Hopefully, Echo has some of these because one crop could be susceptible. Then another variety could be resistant. So it's very important you get the right type of cultivar. So that is something that we need to do. How do we avoid this attack on nematodes? We talk about crop rotation. Well, I know it's over talked so much, but it's important. 
when you rotate crops, you are saying, I will plant a susceptible crop, then at the same time, plant another one that's resistant. It's a very useful tool in management of nematodes. Because at times, the only way to really manage is to give nematodes a target. They attack a crop, you remove the crop, then rotate it with something that's resistant. Here is what we did in Florida with just a small plot showing crop rotation. You can actually see the difference in the crop by just rotating the crop on a very small area. But of course, suppression is the one thing that people talk about a lot, how to suppress nematodes. Well, this is where we talk about soil amendments. It is the one thing that really does a lot of good for crops. So soil amendments should never be forgotten. The organic matter, all the soil, I mean, animal manure, compost, poultry, should be used in terms of the nematodes. Here is the thing. Soil organic amendments not only produce toxic chemicals that kill the nematodes, but they also provide an environment where other soil microflora can then interfere with the nematodes, and that's why we encourage that. So we need to use that a lot. And there is a lot you can actually talk about. Here is another one. The name seed oil can be used. Crab meal, the oyster meal, black walnut. People are experimenting on that because it does produce this allelopathic chemical, jaglon, can be used also for suppressing nematodes. So soil amendments, big thing in nematology. But probably the one thing that you'll find, it depends with a whole lot of other factors, the materials, the composting, application rates, test area, crop rotation, agronomic practices, soil type, all that affects what kind of soil organic amendments you use. So that is important as well. Talking about suppression, this is the big thing now in nematology. Trap and cover crops. That really is big. The use of marigolds not only release natural compounds that control, they can also be used to trap the nematodes. And Sudan grass is used Others include sorghum, sun hemp, cowpea, oat, rye grass, and not only that, the velvet bean, the mucuna, is the big thing for nematode management. Jack bean, hyacinth bean also suppress nematodes. So all these are trap and cover crops that can be used to either trap the nematodes or as a way to suppress them. It's a big thing in nematology. Here is sun hemp. You probably have seen some. It's a trap crop. And not only that, here is where you are intercropping Sudan grass and cow pea, and that is a way to try and suppress nematodes. Another way to do that is to intercrop sorghum in Sudan grass, again, as trap crop in organic farming. That is used a lot by farmers. Now, suppression also goes to following. Well, leave the ground for a while. Don't grow it. And we know the Bible gives us a very good indication. Leave that ground for a while. That's sabbatical. So that also is important following. And that includes tillage. I know a lot of people think of zero tillage. For nematodes, we really want you to till the soil to some extent. So tillage is important. That means when you till the soil, you actually bring up the soil from underneath, and that can kill nematodes by exposing them. So tillage is important for us. Then, of course, as you do that, when you till, you are really managing some of the nematodes in the soils. Then, of course, flooding. I don't think this would be something that's effective in so many areas because, you know, shortage of moisture. But flooding can also, you are killing the nematodes by cutting off the oxygen. That's flooding. 
Another thing we use that's flooding, this is not very far from here, south of Lake Okeechobee, this is where the thing was taken, they would flood these organic fields and then control nematodes. Also, solarization is another way. Put a plastic tap on soil, heat the soil to a point where the nematodes can die. It's another method we suppress nematodes. So that is very successful only under certain conditions. It's not always very good in most of the soils. Then, of course, this is, well, this is how suppression you don't necessarily have to use mechanization to put the plastic tap. You can just put the plastic tap using just manual labor. That's good enough. Then, of course, biocontrol being the last thing. Well, I should have really started on this, but the research on biocontrol at the moment is somewhat at a stagnant stage. The, all the progress we've made in biocontrol hasn't really led to a lot of people using biocontrol as a strategy, but I'll mention it nonetheless. Pastoria penetrans is a bacteria parasite. Also, Pasilomyces, I talked about Pasilomyces a lot. Nematode trapping fungi is another of these nematodes we can, parasites we can use to control nematodes. But that is a bacterial spore that could attach on the nematode, killing it. It's now being used, but unfortunately in Florida, it's now a patent of a private company. So even if you had these bacterial spores in the soils, you cannot work on them because one company felt it's theirs. Now this is where things really get dicey. Here is a natural product, but some people have claimed ownership to that. You cannot talk about bacteria anymore. Here is a case of the bacteria spores or nematodes. You can see how they attack nematodes, killing the nematodes. The trapping fungi really trap the nematodes. You can see those kind of knobs that you see, trapping the nematodes, hopefully choking the nematodes. It has worked in some cases, but not very successful in others. And of course, this one is Pasilomyces. What you see is a nematode egg and the mycelia attacking the egg. Again, this is a slow, painstaking process. But nonetheless, it's something worth the research. So really, in the end, here is my last thing. Whatever you do with farmers, begin with what the farmers know. Complement what the farmers do. Improve slowly. Don't shock them. Chances are they will resist change. So hopefully as farmers, as people in management, that is the strategy that you need to follow. Thank you so much.